Hello everyone, today we are in sunny San Diego taking a look at the all new for 2014 Mazda 3. This has been completely redesigned for the 2014 model year and shares very little with the outgoing Mazda 3 model. It's a very good thing because although the old Mazda 3 was a very good compact car in this segment, it wasn't as exciting as some of its direct competitors. That's all changed for the 2014 model year. Up front we have an entirely new design language for the 2014 model year and it incorporates this new Kodo design language from Mazda. This front end looks very much like the current generation Mazda 6. A look that I wasn't exactly sure about when the 6 rolled out but it's one that I've really grown to like. It's dominated by this very large and very vertical Mazda grille right here. We have this trim strip that's chrome and it wraps all the way around the bottom and off to the other side. It's an awful lot more attractive than the smiley face that the last generation 3 had. Our particular model has the optional HID headlamps that is kind of an interesting thing to note because this segment is really going up market. HID headlamps are optional on the Mazda 3, but the 2014 Toyota Corolla now includes LED headlamps as standard. We have optional active grille shutters down here to help improve fuel economy, depending on the version of the Mazda 3 you get. And in certain models, hidden right behind this Mazda logo is a radar sensor for some of the active collision technologies as well as radar cruise control in the new Mazda 3. Overall, I think this front end is the most aggressive and most attractive in this segment. I find it a lot more interesting to look at than any of the current Japanese competition or even the current Ford Focus. Right now we're taking a look at the hatchback version of the Mazda 3. There is a sedan version. We're going to pop a picture right in this video so you can see what that looks like on the side profile. One of the nice things about the Mazda 3 that I noticed right up front was the overall proportion of the vehicle. The hood is fairly long for a front wheel drive car. It is longer than the last generation Mazda 3 and proportionally it's probably the longest of any of its direct competition. The front overhang is fairly short for a front wheel drive car and the distance between the trailing edge of this tire and the leading edge of this door is also fairly large for a front wheel drive car giving this a more rear wheel drive car proportion. It's not quite BMW 3 Series or BMW X1 of course but I think that the overall profile reminds me an awful lot of that BMW X1. A lot of that has to do with the the sort of cross trainer or tennis shoe overall shape of the Mazda 3 hatchback which I think is very attractive. Also very attractive are these character lines which swoop down from the back and then swoop down across from the front sort of avoiding the slab sided look that you get in an awful lot of the compact cars most notably the Honda Civic and that Nissan Sentra which are definitely more boring from every angle than this Mazda 3. Out back the design cues that made the Mazda 3 very unique up front continue around the back with these tail lamps mimicking the headlamps up front and this accent strip going across inside the lamp module mimicking that daytime running lamp from up front. It's very attractive on the back as well as on the front which is also unique in this segment because a lot of the entries here are kind of boring in the compact sedan segment. A lot of that has to do with the way that Mazda is positioning the Mazda 3. It's not really positioned as a Corolla alternative in some respects because the model line for the Mazda 3 goes way up uh, beyond the current Civic or the current Toyota Corolla. Uh, this particular model here is about $29,000 and it's not fully loaded. There are models of Mazda 3 that will take you over the $30,000 mark and the current generation Toyota Corolla stops just under $24,000. So this could be seen as a premium compact entry rather than a mass market compact entry, especially in the higher level trims. Because our Mazda 3 has the optional 2.5 liter engine, we have these dual exhaust tips out back. If you opted for the base 2 liter engine, you'd get hidden exhaust tips that would be located right under this bumper cover. For 2014, there are two different engine options. There's a 2 liter Sky Active gasoline direct injection engine produces 155 horsepower and 150 pound-feet of torque. That's mated to a standard six-speed manual transmission or an optional six-speed automatic. If you want to spend a little bit more cash, you can upgrade to the 2.5 liter Sky Active direct injection engine, produces 184 horsepower and 185 pound-feet of torque. Unfortunately, that engine is only mated to the six-speed automatic transmission, which is a very nice transmission, but I prefer to row my own. Front seat comfort depends on which model of Mazda 3 you get. Base models do not come with a power adjustable driver's seat, but our model does have that which really improves driver comfort. It means the seat's an awful lot more adjustable than you'll find in any of the current generation Toyota Corollas, Honda Civics, a number of those other entries in the segment that are manual only. We also get adjustable lumbar support, which I find very important in any car. It makes the Mazda 3 one of the most comfortable seats in this segment. It also makes it compete very well with the near luxury entries like the Buick Verano and that Acura ILX. The rear seats in the Mazda 3 are not as spacious as you would find in the Nissan Sentra or in that new Toyota Corolla. Remember the Toyota Corolla has grown considerably for 2014 and sitting behind myself in that new 2014 Toyota Corolla I had about 6 inches of legroom left. 
Here in the Mazda 3, I only have about two to three inches of legroom right here. If I move over to the right side, where the front passenger seat is moved all the way back in its tracks, my knees are touching the front of the seat back. So this is something to keep in mind if you need a large back seat. Overall, seat comfort is very good. These seats are more um, softly padded than you'd find in that Toyota Corolla, so it is something to keep in mind. If I move over to the middle, it's obvious that the hump in this Mazda 3 is also more pronounced than you'd find in some of those other entries. That means that this middle passenger isn't going to be quite as comfortable. I do have a decent amount of headroom, even in our sunroof-equipped hatchback. The rear armrest in our Mazda 3 features two large cup holders, which are notably larger and easier to use than a number of the other competitors in this segment. We have rear seats that fold nearly completely flat with that hatchback load floor. We're going to take a look around the Mazda 3's cabin right now. We have the height adjustable seat belts over there. Keeping in mind that we are in an almost top of the line Mazda 3, some of these options may not be available on the lower end models. Right here we have the perforated leather seats. Leather seats are not optional in most versions of the Mazda 3, only in the very top end trim do you find real cow. The other versions all get a fake leather product. Over here on the dashboard and doors, we have soft touch plastics. Let's continue all the way across the dashboard. I find the shapes overall very pleasing in the Mazda 3. It's very harmonious when you compare it to something like the new Toyota Corolla or the new RAV4, which uh, you know, just have very discordant shapes going on with them. And I find the dashboard an awful lot better looking than what's in the uh, current generation Honda Civic with that dual level dash. Up here, we have the optional 7-inch touchscreen infotainment unit. If you don't opt for this particular unit, then you get a smaller uh, unit right here that's just radio. It's manual buttons and a small two-level electrofluorescent display. We don't have access to that, but we'll post a picture right here so you can see what that looks like. This reminds me an awful lot of the current generation BMW iDrive system. I think that's a good look to go for. Down here, we have the dual zone climate control, which is unique in this segment. Uh, there aren't very many vehicles that have this, uh, pretty much just the Forte and this current generation Mazda 3. Uh, we have heated seats up here. We have a little warning display right there for the passenger. We have a single slot CD player there below, sport button on our particular model. The automatic transmission does have a manual mode with paddle shifters behind the steering wheel. This knob right here is the command knob for that infotainment screen. This has greatly improved over the previous generation of Mazda uh, infotainment system. We'll go over that in a bit. Down here we have two large drink holders. These are not adjustable, but they are quite large as you can see. They easily accommodate a large takeout style drink. If we move on back to the center console, lift this out of the way, we'll find two USB ports right there. You can see one, two. This is the SD card for the navigation data, an auxiliary input, and this is the only power outlet that's available right up front. Close this lid, see a fairly decently built armrest with contrasting stitching in our particular model. One nice feature is that the release handle for this is all the way around the front. So you can grab it from this narrow portion of the front or from the larger portion of the front. So it's easy to open if you're a driver or a passenger. If we take a look at the steering wheel, this is the same steering wheel that you'll find in the Mazda 3. We have a little bit of carbon fiber-esque trim going on right here on the steering wheel. That matches what you'll find on that gauge hood right up there. Our particular model has the push button start. We can see it right there behind that stock. We have cruise control buttons right here on the front. If we had radar cruise control on our Mazda 3, there'd be some additional buttons there. And then over on the left, we get our radio control buttons. The Mazda 3 scores seven out of 10 points in our exclusive trunk comfort index. I have the largest roller bag you can carry on a domestic flight back here with me. So you can see you can fit several of them in the trunk. It is notably smaller than the Nissan Sentra's trunk, but we do get a nice trunk close assist handle, which makes it easier to close the trunk. One of the biggest changes for the 2014 model year is this all new infotainment system. It's a seven inch touchscreen LCD with this control knob that's down here in the center of the dashboard. This bears very little resemblance to the system that I disliked in the Mazda 6 and the current generation CX-5. So if you recall that video, I had a lot of negative things to say about that infotainment system, but this software and this control unit are completely different than that system. So forget everything that you know about the Mazda 6's infotainment system as we dive into this one. If you don't care about infotainment, just follow the instructions below and skip on over to the drive section. Everything is controlled by this command knob right here in the center of the dashboard, but we also have a touchscreen LCD, so you can also touch this screen if that's more convenient for you. I really like that option. It's something that not very many manufacturers give you, uh, and it's kind of hit and miss. Some of the GM vehicles do that, some of the Nissan and Infiniti products do it, but not all of them. I do like the ability to choose those options 
you know, whichever one is easier for you because some people find the knob and joystick down here just a little bit more difficult to use. That home button takes you back to this screen. This is not a rotating option screen, so there's nothing off the screen that you can choose. Everything is right there. It's just those five options, applications, entertainment, communication, navigation, and settings. So we're going to go over these one by one. The apps option can be selected by that knob or again by just touching the screen. And this will give you your HD radio traffic map. This does not require a subscription. We don't have anything in our particular area. We have the fuel economy monitor, which will also give you information about your IE loop system if your vehicle is so equipped. We have direct access to our other applications. We can hit over to the next screen using this system and see the fuel economy for this drive as well as the average for this drive and then right back to that same fuel economy screen. We can go back to the applications tab via that screen, go on to maintenance, see what needs to be maintained on the vehicle. There's also the ability to vehicle data transfer onto a USB stick so you can get that to your dealer or whoever else. We hit the home button, we'll go on to the entertainment system that can also be accessed by this knob right here on the dash that's a fixed knob right there. We have source over here, AM, FM, entertainment. It's all very logical and easy to use, especially if you use something like BMW's iDrive. Uh, we have AHA, Pandora, Stitcher Radio, Bluetooth integration, dual USB ports right there in the center stack, CD player, and an auxiliary input as well. The joystick not only rotates and clicks to enter, but you can also go side to side to click back. If we go to the channel list, you'll see XM channels, very easy to use. Going back, we have our favorites, those are like presets. We have a scan mode, we have forward and backward, then we have our sound settings right over there. Uh, we do have the optional center point surround system in our particular tester. Hit back to that music note. We can change our audio source down to the Apple device that's connected so we can see what that takes a look like. And as you can see, this is considerably faster than previous generations of the system, most notably that Mazda 6, where if you plugged in a USB device, it could take up to 15 minutes before the car started playing. That doesn't happen with this system. The system caches all the information, so it starts playing immediately on your device, and it will remember devices that have been plugged in in the past. We have full access to our iDevices playlists, artists, albums, genres, songs, etc. All voice commandable, just like most of the other products in this segment, most notably Ford's My Touch. Over here on the song list, you can see what's in the current playlist that you're already on. Hit back again to go back. We have repeat, shuffle. You can play more like this. That's dependent on your device and how your device defines what is like this in music. Forward, backward, pause, etc. And again, those same sound settings. Going back to the screen, you'll find Bluetooth, Pandora, and Stitcher in, in, uh, integration. These are all fairly self-explanatory. They do require a smartphone like this paired iPhone 5 in order to work, but the systems do integrate very nicely. Back to the home button, we'll see the communication option is right there. Anytime you're in an option in the system where you don't have a device paired, it will prompt you if you'd like to pair a device. The pairing was very easy on our iPhone and iDevice, uh, as well as Android devices that we tested with the system. It's a fairly standard phone interface over there. If you click on over to the nav system, we'll find a much improved nav interface versus the last generation product as well. As you can see, zooming in and out on this system is considerably faster than it was in the previous generation. Clicking the knob again, we can find the screen to enter a new destination. Over here, we can find an address, navigate home, etc. We want to click that find the address button. We can start by entering one here. And this is where touching the screen is easier. So for instance, if we wanted to uh, spell out a city here, Los Gatos right there, and we'll browse on down to Main Street. This is an area where this system surpasses uh, anything currently out there on the market like iDrive that uses a command knob in this fashion because entering an address is just far easier. Even in something like a, uh, an Audi MMI system with that little finger scrolly thing, this works an awful lot better. You can just hit the Navigate To button and navigation happens very quickly in this system compared to some of the others. We are navigating, you know, more than five or 600 miles here, 480 miles there. Uh, so you can see how quickly that was to route to that address. The nice thing about the system also is if we're here in the new destination screen and we're, you know, finding a place and we're filtering by name, something like this, and we decide that we want to change something about our audio system and we hit the audio button like this, we can go and switch tracks we want to listen to Taylor Swift now. And then when we click back to the navigation button, you'll notice that we've popped right back to where we left off. This is very intuitive because computers operate like this. I mean, if you're on your desktop computer and you know, you're web browsing and you need to go and answer an email and you switch over to your email to answer an email and you switch back to your web browser, you expect it to stay where you left off. 
Most systems do not do this, but this system will, and it makes it very easy to use compared to some of the other competitors. You can enter that nav button to get right back to that navigation screen. We'll go to the home button, then we can see what's in our settings. And our settings is where you'll find all of your various vehicle and device settings right here. We have clock, we have vehicle. Uh, this is another area where you can toggle up and toggle down. The only problem with the system that I did notice is in order to go from this portion of the screen right here to the top portion, you toggle to the right uh, for some reason to go to those various tabs rather than just clicking up to the tab and then scrolling across them. Uh, really a very minor uh, comment on that one. The system is supposedly also upgradable, so as uh, Mazda begins to release additional features for the system, most notably new apps right over here in this application ses uh, section, they claim that you'll be able to add those ve vehicle upgrades. Uh, they haven't really said how far that will go because most vehicles that do allow upgrades like this, it seems like those apps never happen or happen very infrequently, and then you're left behind. So I don't expect something terribly different out of Mazda, um, but I do expect you know, additional applications to be able to happen right over here. They've also said that they're going to open this up to third-party developers, so again, we'll see how that really progresses. Before we go out for a drive, let's take a look at the rubber. These are 215-45R18 tires on, of course, 18-inch rims. These really help the Mazda 3 handle better than some of the competition that has higher profile rubber and narrower rubber. But it does mean that there's a little bit more cabin noise going on inside the Mazda 3 out on the highway, but we'll talk about that later. The Mazda 3 has long been known as the performance and handling alternative in the compact sedan segment, and that continues with the 2014 version. This sedan has electric power steering just like pretty much everybody else in this segment, but Mazda has done a few things to tweak the suspension in this car and make the electric power steering a little bit more engaging. The first thing they've done is they've changed the, changed the suspension geometry up front in the Mazda 3, allowing there to be more feedback from those front tires to the steering rack. And because electric power steering numbs those steering responses, they have to increase the input so that you still get something out of it in the end. And the change really does make a difference in the 2014 model. Even though there is still a little bit of a numb feeling out on the roads, and it's still not as exciting as previous generations of Mazda 3 with hydraulic steering, it is more engaging than anybody else in this segment, and that includes the current generation Ford Focus. The ride in the Mazda 3 is a little bit stiffer than you'll find in the rest of the competition. That's simply a trade-off that needs to be made when it comes to performance and handling in a compact sedan. It's not rough, however, so don't think of the Mazda 3 as harsh. I would just describe it towards the firmer side of most sedans. Something that I would normally equate with um, performance luxury sedans like BMW or Audi or something along those lines in their relatively mass market models, which are typically stiffer sprung than economy cars or the mass market segment. True to Mazda's mission, there is still a manual transmission available in the Mazda 3, but it's only available with that base 2 liter engine. The 2.5 liter engine version that we're in right now is a 6 speed automatic only. All the transmissions are very nice to drive. I don't think that the six-speed manual is quite as accurate or quite as precise as Honda's six-speed manual in the Honda Civic Si, but that's really high praise for any sedan. The Civic Si just has a very nice feeling transmission. I would rank that above quite a number of rear-wheel drive transmissions, to be honest. Honda just has a very nice unit and very nice clutch feel, but the Mazda 3 is a very close second. The six-speed automatic transmission is essentially the same unit that's found in the Mazda 6, it has a very nice feel to it as well. Part of Skyactiv's design, and that's their efficiency technology built, built into the Mazda 3 and the Mazda 6, is a transmission that uses the torque converter uh, lockup feature quite frequently. So unlike most transmissions, which spend maybe 40 to 50% of their time in torque converter lockup, the transmission in the Mazda 6 and Mazda 3 will spend 80% or more time in lockup mode, which makes the transmission feel more like a dual clutch or a manual transmission than you'd find in most normal automatics. That's most obvious when you're going downhill and you need engine braking because that torque converter is still locked up, so there's a direct mechanical connection between the wheels and the engine rather than going through that fluid converter. Um, that makes the transmission and the engine feel much more connected. It makes the shifts feel a little bit firmer than you'd find in some of the other transmissions and overall just a little bit more engaging. As a result of that transmission design, fuel economy is also greatly improved. The 2-liter version of the Mazda 3 with the automatic transmission will get 41 miles per gallon on the highway, and that is a very high number. The average of the Mazda 3 sedans with the 2-liter engine is also right there among the top CVT competitors like the all-new Toyota Corolla as well as the Nissan Sentra. All of the other automatic transmission models in this compact sedan segment are all just a little bit below 
those three vehicles, which are almost tied with one another at the top end of the fuel economy market. That's really a, uh, a big improvement over the previous generation Mazda 3, and it really is saying something about the Skyactiv technology in general and its ability to improve performance as well as reduce fuel consumption. In terms of absolute performance numbers, we scored 7.6 seconds from 0 to 60 in this 2.5 liter equipped Mazda 3 hatchback with the automatic transmission. If you're in the sedan, we expect that time to be just a little bit shorter because the sedan is a hair lighter. If you're in the 2 liter version of the Mazda 3 sedan or hatchback, we expect that time to be about a second longer just because that engine isn't quite as powerful. One thing to know is that those times are considerably shorter uh, than the competition, most notably the Toyota Corolla or the Honda Civic. If you're in the top level Kia Forte, the performance is relatively similar. And if you're comparing this to something like a Buick Verano or an Acura ILX at the very top end, performance isn't that far off the Acura ILX with the 2.5 liter engine in this uh, Mazda and the 2.4 liter engine in that Acura. But the Buick Verano is going to be considerably faster with that two liter turbo. When it comes to road noise, the Mazda 3 scores a little bit better than the outgoing model. We ranked 73 decibels in our test at 50 miles an hour on an asphalt road surface. That is just a little bit louder than the Acura ILX or the current generation Honda Civic. It's about the same as the current 2014 Toyota Corolla. Of course, the differences between most of the entries in this segment are about three to four decibels, and that's really a very small difference between vehicles, so that is something to keep in mind. They're all fairly similar when it comes to road noise. The Mazda 3 is just a little bit higher than some of the others because of the size of the tires. 215 with rubber on this particular vehicle. A number of the other uh, vehicles we've tested in this segment had smaller rubber. And uh, if you get narrower rubber in a car, then you're going to have less road noise because there's less of a contact patch. That's just something to keep in mind. We haven't had much of an opportunity to test braking in the Mazda 3, but I expect it to score very well based on the low curb weight of the Mazda 3, as well as the fact that we get four corner disc brakes in all versions of the Mazda 3, whereas the base versions of the Toyota Corolla still employ rear drum brakes, which don't have the same fade resistance of disc brakes. So overall, based on prior performance in the Mazda 3, I would say this ranks fairly well, but we'll let you know when we get a chance to review one for a full week and we get to put it through our normal battery of tests, including a new 60 to zero test that we plan on doing in all future vehicles. Mazda has priced the three very aggressively for 2014. The sedan starts just under $17,000 and the hatchback is about a $2,000 premium in base form over that sedan. You do get a few more features in that base hatchback than you do get in the base sedan, so do keep that in mind that the real cost difference between the two is just a little bit smaller than that $2,000. Fully loaded, a Mazda 3 hatchback ends up over $31,000, which means that the Mazda 3 also crosses over into the entry-level luxury category. So you can compare this to something like a Buick Verano or an Acura ILX, and I think it actually compares very favorably with the likes of those two vehicles. And over $30,000 for a Buick Verano doesn't seem that abnormal to most Buick buyers, Honestly, when you take a look at the interior of the Mazda 3, the exterior of the Mazda 3, and all the options that you can get in the Mazda 3 that you cannot get in an Acura ILX or a Buick Verano, then the price is justified in my opinion. So where does that place the Mazda 3 in terms of the competition? Well, that's a very good question. I would call this the current leader in the compact sedan segment, easily beating the current generation Kia Forte for a number of reasons. Part of that has to do with the luxury options available in the Mazda 3, but also the handling performance. I like the Kia Forte because of its overall value proposition and the overall luxury items on the inside, its overall size and style, etc. But it's not the best handling or the best feeling vehicle out on the road. The former Mazda 3 was the best handling and best feeling vehicle out on the road, but it didn't deliver any of those luxury features that I personally like. This new 2014 Mazda 3, however, combines all of the features that you can find in the Kia Forte, plus a few extra, and incredible styling and incredible handling, placing this at the top of my pack. That Kia Forte is still very appealing from a value proposition at $24,000, because at $24,000, you do get a few things that you can't get in this Mazda 3, like a cooled seat, heated steering wheel, things like that, not available in the Mazda 3 at that price. However, if you option up your Mazda 3 all the way, then it competes very nicely with the likes of that Acura ILX, as well as the Buick Verano. Now, the Acura ILX does have a better brand name and a better warranty than this Mazda 3, but I think that the Mazda 3 is still a better car than that ILX. The Buick Verano is very tempting, especially because of that two liter turbo engine that is much faster than the Mazda 3. It doesn't handle quite as well, but it definitely is a performance machine. I would call this a decent tie with that Buick Verano, accounting for the differences between brand and uh, overall value, etc. Still an incredible package in this Mazda 3. 
Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been our quick look at the 2014 Mazda 3 hatchback. Be sure and click down on that subscribe banner so you can be updated on all of our latest videos, including a more complete video review on the Mazda 3, but we can get our hands on it for a week and tell you what it's like to live with. Be sure and comment on this video, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. You can also send us messages right here on YouTube, and we'll see you next week.